So I'm really sorry, but this is a second part to my video since we had some technical difficulties in the first half. Um, I will upload two separate videos, so I apologize for that. The place where my video left off was on this summary. I'll go over it just quickly again, but we are trying to figure out, are there any holes in our current curriculum that we could go ahead and fill? Uh, think about our books, documentaries, items that we give our kids. Can we do anything differently that will allow us to explore our students' cultural differences in a positive and an enlightening manner? Relationship building with our students will help empower their learning. We're already doing this fantastically here at Dobbins. I feel like we're just scratching the surface though, and I've mentioned before that there's so much more we could do with that. I think that it's important that we don't just do those relationship building with our students, but with their parents, guardians as well, because their home life is a huge part of their school life. What happens at home, how they interact with their adults, um, the support that they get at home to complete tasks here for school, it's all interrelated and the relationship building is really important for that. Our lessons and assignments, are we providing multiple options? Do kids have choice in, um, in projects? Do they have any input? Uh, can they demonstrate their learning in other ways? Like instead of just a graded test, maybe we start working with portfolios. So to have a supporting our culturally responsive teaching, um, this is some data that was done in San Francisco. It was about 1,400 students that they used and in, um, enrolled in an ethnic studies course. Of those 1,400 students, um, they emphasized cultural affirmation and their grades actually increased as well as their student attendance in school. So CRT with fidelity, meaning we're doing it all the time. It's just not a one-off thing. What does it mean for Dobbins, ESOL students, and for us as teachers? Well, the intent is we have more engaged students. They're going to celebrate and recognize diversity. It's going to bring them together instead of separating them. Inclusion and, equi inclusion and equity, um, potentially increased test scores, just like we were showing in my um, data and potentially reduce the number of long-term L's because remember, if they're in longer than five years, that number starts to increase for those that are dropout. This is an example of the power of CRT. So I worked with five teachers here. Um, as part of my culminating project, I used two of those five teachers to teach them about culturally responsive teaching, what it means, how to do it, what it should look like in class for us and our students and our lessons. The other three teachers, I did not mention what CRT was. I didn't bring it up. I just asked if they could give me scores for a pre and post test that they created for their students. So I took those five teachers and a completion of six classes in all and one of the classes indicated here shows that our ESOL students between the pre and post test within that culturally responsive teaching class had an average increase of 29 points versus the non-CRT class. Those students had an average increase of 16 points. Is 16 points great? Yeah, it is. But 29 points is exceptional. You're looking at Maybe it could impact whether they pass or fail that class. So it made huge, huge strides in the reason why CRT is so important. So our positive initial results, yes, these scores don't offer insight into a small fraction of our students and the scores. We're talking only using ELA. We're talking only having five teachers, two of which were trained in CRT but you multiply that by all of our teachers and all of our students, and I think we could see a huge increase in our scores. The pre-post tests were created by the teachers. I had no involvement in that. And though the data is based on only one pre-test, post-test, implication of L-test scores indicates CRT can be successful when used with fidelity. I did create a survey um, to question our teachers here about what CRT was, how they felt 
um, it impacted them or their students in school. I am going to only briefly cover five of those questions with you. So this bar graph just gives you a visual of um, some of the questions, but those questions were, I understand culturally responsive teaching. 90% said, yeah, I know what that is. 10% said, I have no idea. Culturally responsive teaching is important. 80% said, yes, it is very or extremely important. 20% said somewhat. Thankfully, nobody said it was not important. Question three, do teachers have the resources needed? Yes, was only 37.5 and no, 62.5%. So that leads me to wonder, what do they need? This could definitely open us up to some more conversations, other PLs, like what resources would you find helpful to you? Since 90% said that they think it's important, 80% um, said they do it in class, but we only have 37% saying they have the resources. So where is that difference? Are teachers providing culturally diverse content and lessons? Even though 90% said that it's really important, only 70% of them are actually providing the content. Lastly, what could be done to help you with CRT me methods? So professional learning opportunities, 60% said yes. ESOL endorsement, 10% said. And 30% didn't feel like any change was necessary. So the survey led me to create this PL. I wanted to provide my results and helpful tools to help create a culturally responsive atmosphere here at Dobbins. Um, I hope to break down any barriers that might exist and show you guys that CRT is something that we already do. We're already actively involved with that, with our kids, with our teachers, with our families. I just feel like we could go a couple steps further, dig deeper into it and be more involved. Um, because good teachers always push themselves to be better. The next step I'm gonna bring us into is a Nearpod activity. Now this Nearpod teaches us about cultural dissonance. It's going to explain a little bit by why some of our students um, might have more complicated um, situations than others. So let's go through this Nearpod. Now I don't cover all of the slides, but I will be covering some of them. So I might just kind of skip around. So we're going to start with a sprinkle. It's a break the ice activity. We're familiar with these. We do them in our classrooms all the time. In this particular photo, they're showing um, a picture. So my teachers previously looked at this picture and they were like, oh, I noticed the doctor is smiling. I noticed the little boy looks upset. I noticed there is a shot in his hand. I noticed the eye exam sheet behind him. It looks like he has some kind of certificate on the wall. Um, they assumed he must be a doctor because he has a stethoscope and the items on the wall. Um, and that was all great. But on the next slide, we can see it asks, did you wonder why aren't there any other races? Why is he white? Why is the child white? Why does he have green eyes and the boy has blue eyes? How come they're both males? How come a woman isn't there? And where are the child's parents? I know when I brought my child to the doctors and anytime they got shocked or scared, I was always like, oh, baby, it's okay. And I was real close to them. But these are things that we wonder about. Why did we wonder those things? Well, because we're all built differently. Our perspectives, our cultures, our backgrounds influence how we see things. Another aspect that we discussed in the previous lesson that didn't get videoed was this iceberg effect. So what are the things that we can see in the iceberg? Well, at the top half, the one that we can see above water, we see that there's food and clothing, literature, music, holidays. But then underneath the water here, there's deeper things, things we don't typically dig into, like their beliefs and norms, their values, their attitudes, roles of their groups, um, role of an individual, priorities. And these are all really important things that with a little bit of relationship building, we can see more into. So some elements of culture are easier to see, but there's many unseen cultural elements, norms, beliefs. 
A large part of the culture exists below the level of consciousness and awareness, and they influence our kids' behaviors and attitudes. And we need to recognize that all our kids are not from the same backgrounds. Our kids are unique and diverse, and we have to celebrate that, and we have to understand that as we deal with them. So culture influences how we learn and what we value in education. Previously, we talked about cultural dissonance when um, they begin formal academic education. The dissonance has negative effects on their achievement. So your many language learners come from backgrounds with different approaches, and they have to learn a whole new language and a new, often invisible culture here in school. We're gonna get into it a little bit more, talking about individualism and collectivism, um, but this is really important for us to recognize with our students. So let's dig deeper. Now, I just had my teachers at the time raise their hand on whether they agreed or disagreed. And I can tell you that each of them agreed with these statements. Students should be individually accountable for their learning. They agreed. The goal of school is to prepare them for their future. All the teachers agreed. And lastly, literacy is foundational to successful learning. The teachers had all agreed on that as well. So what, what patterns did I see or notice in our responses? Well, since this is my second time doing this and the teachers aren't in here, I can tell you that all the teachers raised their hands on these questions. Now, I can also tell you that all the teachers that attended the first um, viewing of my PL were all white. There was some, mostly women, there was one man, but they all agreed. Is that because we are all from similar cultural backgrounds? Is it because we are from the United States where individualism is celebrated? I'm not quite sure, but those are the patterns I noticed. So um, teaching and learning in a formal academic education usually assumes that our learners should be individually accountable. We give them a test, they take their test, they get the grade they earned on the test. The goal of school is to prepare them for their futures. I think we all can say, yes, we want them to graduate high school. Literacy is foundational, that's true. But not all people who view teaching and learning the same way, especially those that do not come from the United States. The one thing I'm gonna really cover here is individualism and collectivism. This PowerPoint is available for you guys in the earpod though, so you're able to go in and read about the rest. I'm just gonna focus on line one. So individualism versus collectivism. I think this is important because um, this really pertains to a lot of our kids where they come um, from their parents' home countries. So um, it talks about how students identify, identity depends on individual attributes and accomplishments, meaning we really focus on those kids. Oh, they are on a straight A honor roll. Oh, they accomplished, um, uh, a time to run. It's always based on things they do by themselves. Formal academic education is individualistic and it can create cultural dissonance for students from more collectivistic backgrounds. So for instance, the US is an individualistic type of country. So that's what we focus on here in the US. And a few other countries do it as well, but the US is known for it. Collectivistic backgrounds are our South America, Central America, Asian countries. Um, so we have to really recognize that a lot of our especially Hispanic kids are more of a collectivistic background than not. Understanding cultural dissonance is a great way to start or continue with the journey and understanding CRT is important for our students. So I just really wanted to highlight that. I'm going to skip through these sections here, but I did want to cover, I asked my teachers if they would please go ahead and do this in our first week back at school in the fall. I'd love for them to observe their class for a week and keep a journal. I'd like them to notate um, any potential examples of cultural dissonance in their classrooms, especially focusing on that individualism and collectivism that I was talking about. And then how can their observations impact their planning, teaching, or assessing of the students? Maybe it will alter their lesson plans. And it would be great if they'd share that log and reflections, either with their principal. I also said I would love to see them if they cared to share. So going back into our PowerPoint.
These are some resources that I came across um, and have been using in my own classes with my students. Nearpod is one of those items that's found in Clever. It is free to Paulding County teachers. If you access Nearpod and you go ahead and put in the search bar, ESOL, it's going to give you English learners lessons. These lessons are wonderful because they go ahead and break down things for our students based on their can-do descriptors. Now, if you've had ESOL students, you might be familiar with them. If you haven't, let me explain. So their can-do descriptors um, give them a grade level gradient of where and what they should be able to do and how we want to try and push them further into other items. So you can see there's a million and one assignments here. I'm just gonna click on this one because it said sixth grade. Let's see if we can open it. All right, so once you're in the lesson, you can go into the teach mode and you can choose live participation or student paste. Either is fine. It talks about the um, lesson itself. It goes into accessing prior knowledge. It gives visual supports, teacher, uh, teacher modeling. It also allows the students to listen because when we have ESOL students, we're really focused on their reading, writing, speaking, and listening. These Nearpods incorporate all four of those domains and it's really useful. So Nearpod is a great tool for you guys to have and use. The second thing I wanted to talk about was elevation. So within elevation, there are three different sections that are important for us to be aware of. The very first section within Nearpod that I wanted to show you was under strategies and modules, there are lessons for teachers ourselves to learn. So it gives us an introduction to having multilingual learners in our classes intro to the long-term English learners, like I told you about five years or longer, how we can support them and their needs, also introduction to newcomers. So this section right here is for us and our learning needs. The next one is activities. These activities can be sectioned out by grade levels, by their domain, speaking, listening, writing, reading, like I told you. So um, it is really great activities to add in for early finishers. If you're kind of like, well, what can I get them that's educational? These activities are great. If you see your student is struggling with their listening section, it's down here, it says newcomer, there's a video and it's listening. If you think they are struggling with their writing, click on the writing tab and then you can come in and find ones that are writing based. So this is a fantastic, free site for you guys to use in relation to your students. Lastly, collections. These are actual lesson plans that you guys can use with your students. Again, you just click on your grade level, let's choose eight, click on math, and it's going to open up all kinds of activities, actually lesson plans that you can be using. So it gives us our intro, your snippet, your vocabulary. Uh, it allows you to print out your lesson plan, this site is phenomenal. Again, it's one of those things that is used for our teachers. It's there for you to use. You should take advantage of it. The last three are items that I'm going to hand you to take with you. They're called Draw Talk. It's an article that I got while in my ESOL class. I really loved it because the teacher went over a topic. She had the students draw whatever it might be. For instance, in the article, they were talking about snow leopards. So the children drew what they thought the snow, snow leopard was. Then the students broke into their groups. They talked about it with their classmates. They discussed a little more. The teacher came back, provided information. Then the students redrew that snow leopard for the second time. And this time they added in all the details they may not have had with the first drawing. And then thirdly, they go back in the third section and they get to um, talk again. And then on the third section, they write down all the information. I really liked it. Portfolios, I think this is important. Our ESOL kids are not always graded um, equitably because they're not the same as all our other kids. Portfolios, and I have a copy of the documents. On this one, it talks a lot about how these kids should be graded based off of all of their work, not just one copy of their work. 
look at multiple different things. How are they performing in class? How are their assignments being turned in? Now, I learned one key bit of information, and the one thing that sticks with me is we should give our kids more, not less. So it really resonated with me. Like some teachers are like, well, Johnny doesn't speak that well of English, and so I'm giving Johnny less work. In reality, we should be giving Johnny more work. He's capable. We should give him, be giving him that assignment where he has to listen to something. He has to write something. He has to read something. Um, Johnny should not be given less with the assumption Johnny cannot do because then we're just creating Johnny into a helpless victim, and he is not. Um, and lastly, listening stations. Even though we're in middle school, listening stations are really important for our kids. Um, they have to be able to listen without seeing media, just hear it, understand it, be able to write about it, talk about it. So listening stations are still really great items to have in middle school. The questions and answers that I went over with my teachers were, what is CRT? And my teachers were able to um, answer that and knock it out of the park. Um, so it's culturally responsive teaching, using our kids' backgrounds, their traditions, their history, in order to create lesson plans that the kids become engaged and involved with. Why can the methodology help teachers and students? Well, because it's creating that engaged classroom. It's making us want to work together to ask questions. What steps could we start in a week with students that could make a positive impact? One of my teachers had mentioned that they were going to start using Nearpod and also the elevation lessons, which I thought was great. She said she was unaware of them before, but she was going to start using them. And then finally, um, any questions that hadn't been answered? Um, I really didn't have any questions by the teachers at this point. Uh, they pretty much had said that they understood everything that was going on. So for our closing activity, the $2 summary, I did ask the teachers to complete my um, feedback form. And on the back of that, I had them write out their $2 summaries. And I did ask that they use either CRT or ELLS within their response. And so I have a couple of them. I figured I would just read them to you since I don't have the teachers here. So one says, culturally responsive teaching is for the benefit of both students and teachers. It helps the students engage and feel inclusive within the academic environment. Uh, another says, in order for L students to achieve at a higher level, we need to incorporate CRT into our lessons on a daily basis. CRT engages L's by framing their backgrounds and identities as central to the learning process. So I just wanted to read some of them since the teachers were not here to um, be able to share them out to you based on my technical difficulties. And again, I apologize for that. I guess that is everything for me besides just saying that it's important that as teachers, as people, we self-reflect. -re um, we need to be viewing our own beliefs and we have to evaluate and compare and be willing to change and grow because we are in a constantly changing society and our students are never gonna be the same each and every time. We're going to each day get new students. Um, their attitude today may be different than yesterday. Uh, so we just need to be aware of cultural moments that affect their lives and those of our students and how it can impact them um, mentally and create a class with CRT as its center. Thank you.